Awesome. Uh, excited today. We are continuing uh, a series I started a couple weeks ago um, called In the Gap. And uh, I do want to just uh, thank uh, Pastor Mike for preaching and filling in for us last week. Didn't he do a great job? I heard a lot of great things. And uh, appreciate you, Pastor Mike. And uh, it's uh, we uh, we were at Disney uh, last week. We had planned this vacation uh, uh, actually quite a few years ago, <laughs> and uh, and so we just barely made it out of Florida uh, right before the hurricane. We flew out on Monday, and then uh, we heard the news they closed Disney on Wednesday and Thursday, and so uh, our plane was full. People were trying to get out of there, but, uh, but we made it back okay, and uh, it's good to be home. Um, today, uh, our theme verse uh, in this series is Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 29 through 30, and this is what it says. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and the needy and mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. And I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. We said this a couple weeks ago that Ezekiel was written during the time where Babylon was threatening to destroy Jerusalem and annihilate Judah altogether. And God is looking for someone who is going to stand in the gap. The religious leaders during this time had turned away from the Lord. Uh, they were actually mistreating people, the, the foreigner, the poor, the needy. They were also uh, being overlooked. There was all sorts of things going on during this time. And God speaks through Ezekiel and says, I'm looking for someone who will stand in the gap. And we said this last week that the gap means this. It, it, it actually meant a breach in a wall. So walls were there to defend, to defend from the enemies coming in. And so the gap represented that breach. And so if the enemy would attack the hole in the wall, they could get through and destroy. And so that, that was the whole idea. And so what Ezekiel is saying, I'm looking for someone who will stand in the place of vulnerability. I'm looking for someone who will stand in the place of weakness. And so that's what it means to stand in the gap. And so for us, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Are there places of vulnerability? Are there places of weakness that we can stand and be a voice and stand in that gap? And so we're looking at people in the Bible uh, that stood in the gap. Last week, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Nehemiah as Nehemiah was one who had a vision to actually rebuild the walls that were eventually destroyed by Babylon. Ezekiel's prophecy came true and those walls were destroyed. And so God raised up Nehemiah to actually rebuild those walls. He got a vision for what could be and should be. So today, though, I want to look at another character in the Bible who was really one of the most unlikely people that God would raise up. Uh, as Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king, he was kind of a person that, that a prominence. On the other end of the spectrum, we're going to look at a guy named Gideon. And Gideon was a guy that really nobody knew about. He, he, was a, he was one of the most unlikely candidates for God to use. And so we're going to take a look at this story this morning from Gideon. And I love this story because uh, this is a story about how God can eliminate our excuses. Because sometimes we, when we hear sermons like this about standing in a place of weakness or being a voice for the weak or standing up for what is right, and we can hear messages like this. And oftentimes when we hear these type of messages, we can say, well, I don't think God could ever use somebody like me. And I think sometimes we can make all sorts of excuses of why maybe God should choose somebody else. Maybe some of you say, well, I'm too young. I'm just, I'm, just in, I'm just a high school student. What could I ever do? Or some of you might say, I'm too old. You know, I'm, I'm retired. And what, what, what really help can I offer? Some people say, well, I'm not gifted enough. Or no one would really ever listen to me. Or I don't have all the resources. Or I'm just super busy. And, and we can just come up with this long laundry list of excuses of why we cannot be used. But what I find in the Bible is this. Is that sometimes we read the Bible and say, well, God used all these like superhero types. But the opposite is true, isn't it? When you look at the Bible, the Bible, God always uses the unlikely. I mean, David was just a shepherd boy, right? Moses murdered a man. Most of the disciples were just uneducated fishermen. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was actually persecuting the church until God changed his heart. 
And so you just read over and over and over again how God always chooses the unlikely. So here's the point. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I, I don't know, how many of you are basketball fans? I'm a big, I'm a big basketball fan. So uh, I love basketball, um, uh, and I'm a big fan of the early 80s, uh, late 80s, excuse me, early 90s NBA, okay? And uh, I love that era, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, that's, that's my era of basketball when it was a little bit more competitive, and, and, uh, and I love that era. But uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of the guy named Spud Webb. Because Spud Webb was one of those guys that everybody say he would be very unlikely to ever play in the NBA. Uh, in fact, one of the best weekends of NBA basketball is the NBA All-Star Game. And back then, again, things are so different today, but back then the, the NBA All-Star Game was actually competitive. And the East and the West didn't like each other, and they actually, it wasn't just a show and just trying to make money. They, they, they wanted to go out and win. And so that was a big weekend. And one of the favorites on the All-Star Weekend was the Slam Dunk Contest. And even back in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, people, the high all-stars used to participate in the slam dunk contest. Guys like Michael Jordan and Dr. J and Dominique Wilkins, these were guys who actually competed in the slam dunk contest. And so during, I think it was 1986, one of the, again, the least likely person to ever enter the slam dunk contest, 5'7", Spud Webb. By the way, I'm 5'8", Okay. And so you can see the picture is not the greatest, but I mean, he was competing against some pretty big guys during this time. Uh, you know, you had Dominique Wilkins, who was the defending champion uh, the year prior to that, Jerome Kersey, Gerald Wilkins from the Knicks. I mean, these were big, big names back then, okay? And so here comes 5'7", Spud Webb. And I'm sure when everybody saw his name on the list of slam dunk competitors, they laughed. But I want to show you real quickly. We got a quick YouTube clip. Uh, it's one minute long of some of what happened on the slam dunk. Turn the volume up on that. Oh, my goodness. John, this oh. young man has been so impressive. Oh. And a crowd with a standing ovation. But that appears what he's going to do. <laughs> it's conservative, but it still wins people and probably the judges. Back to the double clutch move. That gets him. Boy, the crowd loves him. Oh. Without being able to calm the ball. Out of sight. Woo! And Spud Webb comes through in the clutch. So much excitement wow. around the NBA. It's really terrific to see that happen. And what that does, it gives so much hope to all the little men who played the game of basketball throughout the country. Isn't that cool? I, I love what the announcer said. It gives hope to all the little men who wants to play basketball. So I'll just tell you right now, after that, guess what I did? I had my Nerf basketball hoop hanging on my bedroom door, and I was doing dunks like Spud Webb. But uh, never did get drafted to the NBA, but... Gave me a little hope. But Spud Webb, though, is actually, it's, he's actually a crazy story. I, I, I looked up uh, his backstory, and you think about excuses of why someone like him uh, should not enter the NBA, not only because of his height, uh, but he grew up in Dallas, very, very poor family. Uh, he had six siblings, so there were seven kids all together in a very, very tiny home. You know how he got the nickname Spud? It's, it's, it's crazy that he kept this name. His dad's friend uh, called him Sputnik from the uh, Russian satellite in the 60s, and he said his he head looked square. And so he was making fun of him and calling him Sputnik, and so then the name stuck, uh, and he changed his name to Spud. Uh, so think about that, being made fun of all your life because you have a big head. And then, of course, then not only that... Uh, his height, of course, he was cut uh, from his junior year basketball team, high school team, because uh, he was too small. He came back his high school year, and he made the team, averaged 26 points per game his senior year. 
But then Division I teams didn't want to take him, again, because he was too small. And so he went and played junior college for two years, took the junior college team to the championship. Championship game, he scored 36 points. That got the attention of a Division I NC State. And so they decided to bring him on in the team. Now, he didn't have a, like a, a, a crazy career for NC State. I think he averaged eight points per game. And nobody thought he would ever enter into the NBA. And so he actually got drafted fourth round, all the way down to the fourth round by the Detroit Pistons. But then the Detroit Pistons ended up cutting him. He never played a game. He never even walked on the floor of the Pistons. They drafted him and then let him go. And so you would think that his NBA career was absolutely over, but he walked on for a tryout for the Atlanta Hawks, just walked on. All of the coaches said, no way, there's no way he's ever going to play. One man stood in the gap for Spud Webb. His name was Dominique Wilkins. And Dominique said, we need to give this guy a chance. I think this guy's got potential. And because Dominique was the all-star, if you know a little bit about basketball, he was a big-time player back then. Because he had favor with Spud Webb, they gave him a chance. And then one year later, that was 1985, 1986, Spud Webb ends up beating Dominique Wilkins in the slam dunk contest. Isn't that crazy? And so uh, he ended up, his best year was with the Sacramento Kings. He actually averaged 13 points per game in the NBA. That's pretty good for 5'7". 13 points per game. And uh, the point is this. I, I, as I was just thinking about that, I said, what does this have to do with anything? Well, uh, again, Spud Webb could have been a guy who could have had all sorts of excuses. All sorts of ex excuses. Ah, I, I'm too poor. You know, I grew up in a poor home. He could have had the excuse that, you know, again, everybody made fun of him because, uh, because of his head was too big. I don't know, but he could have had that excuse. Of course, his height was an excuse. He got cut from his high school team. He, did, he got drafted in the NBA but didn't make it his first year. You could think all the excuses in the world, but yet it didn't stop Spud Webb from achieving his dreams and his destiny. And so I, I want you to see today that, that, that we need to eliminate excuses we need to eliminate the excuses. And that's exactly what God does in the life of Gideon. Gideon was a guy who had a lot of excuses, but yet God eliminated all his excuses. If you, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Judges chapter 6 this morning. We're going to look at the story of Gideon. Gideon lived in a dark time in Israel's history. This was the time before the kings. So this is after Israel had come into the promised land. You know, after the 40 years in the wilderness, they're in the promised land. But Judges is such an interesting book. It's like a roller coaster that even though they were in the promised land, this is before kings because God says, I want my law to govern you. But yet they didn't follow the law. They would follow God for a short period of time, but then they allowed the influence of the other nations, their worship, and so they allowed that to influence them. They'd fall away from God. They'd get in trouble. Then they'd cry out to God. God would send a judge to deliver them, and then they'd go right back to where they were again. And it's just this story of just up and down, up and down. And so during a Gideon's time, this is a time where the Midianites, this is a neighboring nation, had basically uh, had, had them in captivity for seven years. The, the Jewish people were so scared of them that they were in hiding. They were hiding in caves. And so it's during this time that Gideon is in hiding that God calls him. And let's look at this. Judges chapter 6, 11 through 15. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abzerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I want you to remember that. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Listen to Gideon's reply. Pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So God is calling Gideon to bridge the gap. He's calling him to stand. And Gideon, again, is this unlikely candidate. Number one, he's living in fear. 
How do I know he's living in fear? Because he's threshing wheat in a wine press. You don't do that. You, you thresh wheat in the wide open. You would take the wheat and throw it up into the air and the wind would take and separate the wheat from the chaff so that he's doubling his work as he's hiding. There is no wind gust in a, in a wine press. And so he's hiding in fear. Second of all, he even begins to doubt God. He questions God. Pardon me, my Lord, where is God while we've been in captivity for these last seven years? What about all those promises about, about the parting of the Red Sea and the manna from heaven and the water from the rock that our ancestors told us about? Where is God now? I'm sure some of us have been in that place. I'm sure some of us today, maybe you grew up in Sunday school and you've heard all the Bible stories and you've heard about all the miracles and, and what God does and, and maybe you even heard testimonies of other people and how God has came through with them. And some of you might be in that place of questioning and say, where is God in my life right now? Where is God right now when, when my loved one is sick? Where is, where is God now when my, my friend has passed away? Where is God now when it just seems like I can never get a break? Where is God? And yet, as Gideon is questioning God, God doesn't slap him over the head. I, I, I love the gentleness of God. What he says is, he says, Gideon, I'm going to give you the strength. I, I'm going to give you the strength to do what I've called you to do. And then Gideon, his excuses really get rolling because then he says, oh, no, 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 no. I can't do this. There's got to be somebody else. I'm the least in my family. I'm like on the low to the totem pole. I'm the lowest of lows. I, I, he even said, I'm the, I'm the weakest. Have you seen my brother? He's got guns. You know, me? No, no, not so much, you know. Uh, he, he's making all these excuses of why he shouldn't be used. But look at verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you. You will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So God says, I will be with you. So here's the big idea this morning that I want us to see, and that's this, is that God is the God of no more excuses. God is the God of no more excuses. He will give us all that we need to accomplish his purpose. And if he's called you to stand in the gap, he's going to give you all that you need. So it's time to get rid of the excuses. I want to show you four things that God gives Gideon. It's a wonderful progression if you look at Gideon. And I really believe this is the progression that God takes us through often in life. He gives four things. The first thing he gives Gideon is he gives Gideon a new identity. He gives him a new identity. Again, how, what did Gideon think of himself? I'm a nobody. I'm the least, right? That, that's how he saw himself. He saw himself as this person that nobody cared about. But how did God see Gideon? Look at verse 12. What does God say to Gideon? He says, the Lord is with you, you what? You mighty warrior. Some scripture says, I think the King James says, you mighty man of valor. You mighty man of valor. Was Gideon a mighty warrior? He was a, he was a farmer in hiding. He wasn't even farming correctly. <laughs> Right? And so in the outside, he wasn't a mighty warrior. That's not how he thought of himself. That's what God thought of him. God saw the future in him. God saw the future. Hey, listen, God sees the future in you. You see, we struggle as a nation with this thing called identity. I think in the West, we struggle with this more than any other uh, nation. We, we, we struggle with identity. We struggle with who are we. We struggle with what the culture says. We live in a, in, a, in a society today where the culture is trying to change our identities. It's being taught in the public school systems. You know, uh, not only change our identity, but then we struggle that we want other people to like us. And so we try to change our identity to try to fit what other people say. Maybe some of us struggle with looking in the mirror and we just struggle with who we are. Listen, we live in a nation as a people that struggles with this thing called identity. But listen to what the Bible says. When you are in Christ, when you put your faith in Christ, the Bible says that you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That means you are placed in Christ. You are placed in him. And so when you are in Christ, you have to look at yourself through the lens of the cross. 
Look at yourself through the lens of the cross. And what does the cross say about you? It says that you are loved. It says that you are whole. It says you are healed. You are forgiven. You are free. You are strong. Some of you may just need to look in the mirror and remind yourself of those things. And stop listening to what you say to yourself. Stop listening to maybe what the culture says about you. Stop listening to maybe if you're a high school student with your, what other people in your school are telling you about yourself. You need to stop listening to those voices and start seeing yourself as God sees you. Because God sees you as a new person. And when we come to faith in Christ, we have this new identity. That's what he did with Gideon, you mighty warrior. Now, the next thing he gives him is he gives him his leading so when we have a new creation, the Bible says now we have God's leading in our life. Uh, I love uh, chapter 6, 17. Gideon replied, if now I have fa found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you that is talking to me. So Gideon does this whole thing. He, he kind of goes back and forth. He's always testing God <laughs> to see whether or not God is leading him. So the first thing, now remember, this is an angel that comes to Gideon and announces this. And so Gideon says, okay, I got to know whether or not this is true, if, if you're really calling me. And so he says, uh, so he goes and he gets this offering. He brings this goat, he brings some bread without yeast, and he puts it on the, on the, on the altar. And then the angel takes his staff, he puts it on the, on the offering, and poof, it just blows up, flames. Now you think that would be enough. I mean, if I had an angel appear to me and have fire just come out of nowhere, I'd be, okay, this, okay I, I'm going, God. I know this is you. But that doesn't stop Gideon. It, 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 Gideon's a hilarious story. Just, just read it. So later on, Gideon is still not for sure. I don't know why. He's, I, I think he's kind of, you know, just uh, not, you know, maybe there's a little fear there. And so, God, I really don't know for sure if this is you to go into army. So how about we do this thing? Uh, anybody heard of, I'm going to put a fleece out before the Lord, you know? And so this is where it comes from, from Gideon. So he says, I'm going to put this fleece out at night. And uh, what's going to happen is, is that all of the ground around the fleece is going to be wet with dew, and then the fleece is going to be dry. And then the next morning, that's what happened. Okay, so there's a second sign, okay? Okay, uh, that means God's in this, right? But that doesn't stop getting. He does, it, he does it a third time. This time, he flips the tables on God. <laughs> He's like, okay, now this time, how about the ground is going to be dry, and the fleece is going to be wet? And then... God does that for him too. And so my point is, is Gideon, he's, he's trying to get a leading on what God is telling him to do. Now, here, here's, here's the caution. Uh, again, I don't advocate for what Gideon did here. <laughs> because uh, number one, we have to understand this is the Old Testament. Okay, so this is under the Old Covenant. And uh, in the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about that we're a new creation in Christ... That means his spirit lives within you. And so when you're a new creation, he gives you a new identity. You have his spirit. Romans chapter 8 says, those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. We have the spirit of God living within us. And I think sometimes, let's talk about excuses. Sometimes we are waiting for a sign to obey what God has already told us to do. And let me say this, delayed obedience is disobedience. Can I say that again? Delayed obedience can be disobedience. Because if God has told you to do something and you're, you're waiting, oh, and then I'm driving down the highway, the next billboard I see has to have a big yes on it. Or I'm going to open the Bible and blindly and just kind of point, okay, God, what, uh, do you, Oh, Jesus wept. Oh, what does that mean? I don't know, you know? And, and sometimes, or I'm going to wait for uh, uh, somebody to come up to me blindly and somebody don't know, and they're going to say something to me to, uh, listen, uh, God can lead those ways. I'm not, I'm, not I'm not excluding that. God can. But I think sometimes we are putting off what God has already told us to do. It's time to get rid of those excuses. God will lead you. The key is get close to him. 
He'll speak to you. Read his word. He speaks to you through his word. Get time in prayer. He'll speak to you through prayer. Spend time listening. Just have a quiet time. Listen. Get around godly counsel. Listen, there's all sorts of ways that the Lord will lead. Get rid of those excuses. God will lead you. Now, here's the third thing he gives Gideon. He now gives Gideon the courage. So he gives him his identity. He has a new identity. He has his leading and thirdly, he gives him courage. I, I love this, Judges 6, 25 through 26. It says, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it and build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Use the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the, burnt, uh, the second bull as a burnt offering. I love this. Now, if Gideon is going to be a leader, he's going to have to be a spiritual leader. And so he's got to have some guts. So what does he do? He decides in the middle of the night, he's going to get rid of all the idol worship in his community. Now, I just want to point out, this is what got Israel in the place that they were in. It was because they had turned away from God and they were adopting the idol worship of the foreign nations. And so the, the first act that he does is he goes down and he tears down all those altars, including his own dad's. He takes down his father's altars. Talk about guts. And then the next morning, the whole town wakes up and they're mad. Where's our altars? Where's our idols? And they're going to kill Gideon. But guess who stands up for Gideon? His dad. He just took down his own altars, but yet now his dad is standing up for him. And he said, hey, if Baal is real, let him defend himself. <laughs> and he, he stands up for his son in this moment. And I just think that sometimes we don't know, when we stand up in courage, we don't know how our courage is going to influence somebody else to stand up. Right? All of a sudden, Gideon's courage gave his father courage. He was proud of his son for what he had done. I don't know if you've ever heard of this story. It's the story of uh, Tel Tel Telemachus, and I hope I'm getting that name right. I got a picture here. You probably heard this story. It's during the Roman Empire, and this is during the Colosseum days when spectators would come, and they would watch gladiators fight each other to the death. It was horrific, and people would cheer, and they would cheer on their favorite gladiator and watch before their eyes gladiators die in a pool of blood. But there was one man, a monk, by the name of Tel Tel Telemachus, and I'm having a hard time saying that name, but there was one monk that knew that it was wrong. And during the middle of this gladiator fight, he jumps out from the crowd, and he begins to cry out, and he, and he begins to cry out, in the name of God, this thing is not right. This must stop. And the crowd was so angry that he had stopped the fighting that they began throwing stuff from the crowd in the Colosseum, hitting him. And the gladiators, in disgust, took their spear and drove it right through him. And here is the monk in the middle of the Colosseum in a pool of blood. But yet, as the people in the Colosseum saw him laying there, they, they, they were silent. Because all of a sudden, they realized what had just happened. They realized that this was wrong. And because of this one man's stance of courage, guess what happened? These gladiator fights be became, began to become fewer and fewer and fewer until they ceased altogether. The point is, one man influenced an entire nation. Why? Because he had the courage to stand up for what was right. And I'm just here to tell you, friends, that you don't know how your stance of courage is going to affect other people. Listen, I, I, let me talk to the high school kids. You know, we, we, we live in a, in a culture today where, where everything that is, uh, what is sin is now okay. And I, and I think sometimes when we stand up for what we believe in and what the Bible says, listen, there are going to be people that are going to say, ah, oh, you know, you're just, you're just a Jesus freak. You know, you're just, you're just extreme. But listen, when you stand up for what you believe in and what the principles of the Bible says, listen, you don't know how your stance of faith is going to affect others. And I think that goes for all of us in the workplace, in our family. Be courageous and stand up for what you believe. And here's the fourth one, the last one. God will give you the strength. Not only will God give you the courage, but God will give you the strength. I love this part. This is the favorite part of my story. So Gideon is about to go to war. He's got his men. 
He's recruited his men. He blew the trumpet and he called the people to follow him. But listen what happens in Judges 7 2. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into, the, into their hands, or Israel would boast against me that my own strength has saved me. So God wanted to do a miracle, but he wanted the glory to go to him. He didn't want the glory to go to man. He didn't want somebody to say, oh, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. So he says, Gideon, you've got too many men. So this is what, anybody ever seen the show Survivor? Like, I don't even, I can't even believe Survivor's still on. Like, it's been on forever. But it's like these, these guys that get on this island and they try to survive the island and then they vote off the weakest member of the island and, and until somebody wins the million dollars. Well, it's just kind of like this. So Gideon's got this mighty army and God says the first thing we're going to do is we're going to eliminate everybody that's scared. And guess what happens? 22,000 men leave. <laughs> 22,000. Like, like Gideon's probably thinking, oh, okay, maybe 100, 200 people are scared. Nope, 22,000. Just all of a sudden, yeah, I'm kind of scared. I'm leaving out of here. And so Gideon's like, okay, God, okay, my army is just shrunk by 22,000. Uh, I think we're going to be okay. And God says, nope, still got too many. Got too many men. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to take them down to the water bank, and I want you to watch how they drink. Because one group of men is going to get down on their hands and knees like this, and they're going to put their face in the water. Okay? The second group of men is going to take their cup, and with a hand, they're going to take their hand like a cup, they're going to scoop it into the water, and they're going to put it up to their face, and they're going to lap the water like a dog. And he says, I want you to look at these two men, and we're going to separate the two. And he said, the men who took the water and cupped it with their hand and lapped it like a dog, those are the men that you're going to use. I'm sure Gideon was nervous. Sure enough, he sees all his men go to the water, and guess what? Only 300 cup with the, the water with their hands and lap it like a dog. And God says, those are the men. Those are the men that you're going to take to battle. 300 men. A lot of people think that Midian's army was way over 100,000. And yet they were outnumbered. But yet God had a plan. You see, God had a plan that it was going to be in his strength not Gideon's strength. And so the story goes that, that through the strategy, this is one of the greatest strategies that he has in the middle of the night. He has the 300 men surround the camp in the middle of the night. He has them blow their trumpets all at the same time, which was a signal of war. In the middle of the night, they are just, you know, again, they're sleeping. They don't know what's going on. The Midianites wake up and, and, and they think that they're being attacked. Gideon has them have their jars of glass and they break their jars and then all they can see is this light that blinds them. They can't see very well and they begin attacking themselves. The Midianite armies begin to attack and kill each other and then those who didn't know what was going on, they were scared and they fled. These 300 men hardly had to lift a sword and Gideon and the army was victorious that day. But the point is this, the point is, is that God was trying to teach a lesson that it was going to be in his strength and his power. The, the glory was not going to go to any man. The glory had to go to God. Listen, we can accomplish more in the strength of God than we can do with our own strength. And so we got to depend upon the strength of God. And that's great news for some of you this morning because some of you say, well, I don't have the strength to do what God has called me to do. You're exactly right. You don't. You don't have the strength. That's the place that God wants you to be. If you're in a place where you think, I can't do this, then God's like, then you're the person I want for the job because God wants to get the glory. God wants to get the praise. See, it's going to be his strength. Zechariah 4.15, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. So as the worship team is going to come back up this morning, what's your excuse? What's your excuse today? You see, maybe God is speaking to you about something. And maybe you've been making excuses about why it can't be you. Maybe God is speaking to you about starting a new business. Maybe God is speaking to some of you to stand in the gap in a ministry and maybe be used. I know here at Stonebridge, we have lots of opportunities with ministries right now. As, as some, you know, some of our seniors have transitioned on in our youth department, we have lots of opportunities. And our kids, we have opportunities. 
Maybe some of you, God is speaking to you about missions as we've talked about helping places like Circle of Freedom or God has burdened you about a missions project or a people group. And maybe God is speaking to you about that. You know, maybe for some of you, it's God wants you to stand in the gap for a friend or there's somebody that you know or a cause. Uh, there's something that, that, that maybe even just to be courageous and, and you know that in your workplace that, that everybody is going in one direction and they're standing for something and for you to be courageous to stand up and say, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't believe that way. And that's a courageous act to do. I don't know what God is speaking to you today. But I want you to know today, God is the God who eliminates all our excuses. And if God has called you to do something, he is going to give you the strength to accomplish it. He's gonna give you all that you need. So know these four things this morning. Listen, maybe some of you struggle with identity. I want you to know today, you're loved, you're chosen. God has spoken to you and, he, and God has said, you're mine, child, you are mine. Though you walk through the, the waters, I will be there. When you walk through the fires, that fire will not hurt you. God's saying his presence is with you. You are his, you are adopted. You are a co-heir with Christ. Maybe some of you today, you're, you're praying for leading and you're looking for a sign and looking for a sign and looking for a sign. Listen, don't let delayed obedience be disobedience. You've got God's spirit in you. Take that step of faith and he's gonna lead you. Maybe some of you, it's, it's you're struggling with fear. Well, what if, what if, what if, what if? Listen, the scripture says God is not giving you a spirit of fear. He's giving you power and love and a sound mind. Don't let fear stop you from doing what God has called you to do. And lastly, like we said, God will give you the strength because it's to him be the glory. It shouldn't ever be about us. It should always be about him because the glory is not about me. It's not about you. It's about giving him praise. So this morning, let's eliminate the excuses. And if God is speaking to us today to stand in the gap, I pray that you would take those steps and let God do the rest. Let God do the miracles for you. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning.